Uh, today we are going to hear from Jeffrey Hughes, a PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, he will be presenting his doctoral research on new insights into Moravian pottery production in Old Salem, the view from Lot 38. And this is part of our October Archaeology Month uh, celebration of Archaeology Month throughout the month, uh, and it is our second to last event. Our final event will be this Saturday, October 27th, when we will have our Archaeology Day in the Bicentennial Mall, uh, right next to the Museum of History. Um, so please join us for Archaeology Day this weekend, and for now, please enjoy this lecture from Jeff Hughes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Hughes, and as Rosie said, I'm a doctoral candidate at UNC Chapel Hill. And today I'm going to be talking about my ongoing dissertation research at Old Salem, which is focused on the pottery kilns and the production of pottery on Lot 38. I wanted to start this morning with a little bit of background. Um, in 1752, Moravian Bishop August Gottlieb uh, Spangenberg, under the direction of Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, led an expedition to find a suitable location in the back country of North Carolina to set up a colony for the renewed Unitas Fratrum, commonly known as the Moravians. The church purchased 98,985 acres from John Cartlett, 2nd Earl Grenville, which they named Wachau. This was later Latinized to Wachovia. And it was named after one of Zinzendorf's family estates near Austria. Soon after, 12 single brothers followed the Great Wagon Road down from the church's settlements in Pennsylvania they established Bethabara in 1753. Bethabara means house of passage. In 1759, they established Bethania. Then they established Salem in 1766. Salem was meant to be the administrative and trade capital of Wachovia. In 1773, they established Friedberg. Then in 1780, they established Friedland and Hope. Hope was an English-speaking settlement. Wachovia Tract became the heart of the southern province of the Moravian Church in America. From Wachovia, the Moravians could continue their worldwide missionary effort, expanding it into the American South. <clears throat> Though primarily they aimed their missions in the South at the Cherokee, they would also include work among the Creek and contact with the Catawba, and eventually a mission to enslaved Africans and African Americans. But now I'd like to take you back in time, specifically November 3rd, 1795. By the way, November 3rd was a Tuesday, um, and that'll give you some sense of how detailed the Moravian record keeping could be if you're not already familiar with records of the Moravians in North Carolina. The place was Salem, and specifically a meeting of the Aufseher Collegium, the church board that oversaw the day-to-day -day running of the town. Members of this board included the town's master craftsmen, and the board functioned like a guild, assigning apprentices, regulating trade, and they often acted as arbiters of labor and trade disputes in town. On November 3rd, there were three items related to the pottery that the Collegium took up. One item, quote, the behavior of the boy, John Butner, is becoming worse all the time in the pottery. He also begins to be harmful to other young people in the community. Brother Christ is going to talk to his guardian and see to it that the indentures are exchanged so that he would leave the community, except if he repents his former way of life with all his heart. 
John Butner apparently changed his behavior for the better because he went on to become the master potter in Bethabara. Another item on the agenda was, quote, the Negro Peter Oliver is still asking and praying to be taken into the pottery. Brother Christ therefore suggested to take him into daily work, and whenever something would happen, he should be dismissed at once. Peter Oliver was one of several enslaved people living in Wachovia after the American Revolution. During this period, church officials in Salem forbid the private ownership of the enslaved, so most were owned by the church and leased out to individuals. Private ownership, however, was permitted for Moravians living outside of Salem or in one of Wachovia's other settlements. At this time, Peter Oliver was living in Bethabara and was hoping to return to Salem. A third item, quote, Brother Chris showed us a sample piece of stoneware which he made in our pottery shop, and we are all very glad that the first firing came out so well. Rudolph Christ was Salem's second master potter, and he had just embarked on an expansion of the pottery. This included building a small faience kiln across the street from the workshop. He would eventually supervise the construction of three kilns on the east side of Main Street. Christ had taught Peter Oliver how to make pottery in Bethabara when he was the master potter there. So when Peter Oliver petitioned to return to Salem, Christ knew what he could expect from him, and Christ likely had the work. Looking for evidence of the pottery in these three kilns has been a priority for Old Salem since the 1950s. This meeting of the Aufseher Collegium, I think, is important because it provides a window into three interrelated themes that I'd like to use to organize my talk today. The apprentice John Butner's behavior and the need to repent highlights theme number one, which is the relationship between religion and economics. The approval of enslaved potter Peter Oliver's return to Salem from Bethabara highlights theme two, the relationship between race and how it played out on the landscape. And Chris showing the collegium that he successfully made stoneware highlights three, theme three, the relationship between tradition and innovation, especially as it pertains to embracing new wares and techniques in Salem's pottery. Next, I'd like to offer an overview of Salem's congregation-owned pottery. <clears throat> the pottery was started in Salem under Gottfried Aust when he moved there from Bethabara in 1771. Over time, there were three master potters who were in charge of this church-owned business. Gottfried Aust from 1771 until 1788. His apprentice and then journeyman, Rudolf Christ, took over in 1789 and ran the pottery until 1821. Then Chris's apprentice and then journeyman, John Frederick Holland, took over the congregation-run pottery from 1821 until 1829. The pottery became an important center for the production of pottery in the entire region. Not only did the pottery supply local needs, it drew customers from all over the backcountry. The pottery, though, was also a teaching space. The pottery trained several apprentices and employed journeyman potters who then went out into Wachovia and beyond practicing their trade. The pottery started on lot 48 and eventually occupied lots 49, 38, and 39. So you've got four lots in total, two on each side of Main Street. The church formally divested itself of the pottery business in 1829 after the pottery had incurred several years of debt. But Holland continued producing pottery in Salem, but this time as a private business. He was allowed to rent the old workshop and tools, and he continued firing pottery in a kiln that was built on the back of his lot. In 1831, the kilns on lot 38 and 39 were torn down 
and later that property was repurposed for other uses. Some notable wares produced in Salem. Um, and again, the emphasis here is gonna be on only some notable wares, um, just because I don't have time to go over all the different types of wares and vessel forms that were produced in Salem. Um, but suffice it to say that early on, most of the pottery was either wheel-thrown coarse earthenware with a clear lead glaze, or it was slipped, and sometimes they used a trailed slip decoration. Over time, in addition to producing coarse earthenware, the pottery incorporated new styles that were fashionable in Europe and the broader Atlantic world. Two itinerant potters who visited Salem are extremely important to the story of innovation at the pottery. In 1773, the Staffordshire potter, William Ellis, came up from Bartlam's factory in South Carolina and showed them how to make refined molded earthenwares. These were the latest fashions in Britain, and they included things like queensware and tortoise shell. <clears throat> Again, in 1793, the German potter Karl Eisenberg visited the town, and he showed them how to make faience, which is a lead glaze with tin ash added. He also left behind a handwritten booklet with faience glazing formulas. And of course, Rudolf Christ would become known as the potter who introduced molded figural and animal bottles to the pottery, especially after 1800. As I said before, looking for evidence of Salem's congregation-owned pottery has been a priority since almost the beginning of Old Salem. And this has been primarily the work of four archaeologists that have led up to today's project. Beginning in the 1950s, Albright looked at lot 39, where he found a brick with a high gloss that he interpreted as belonging to one of Christ's kilns. And then he also looked at lot 49. He didn't find any evidence of a kiln, but he did surface collect several small sherds from the western portion of the lot. So this showed that they were at least on the right track and in the right area to locate evidence of the congregation-owned pottery. Next, in the 1960s, Stanley South's work on lot 49, one of the results was that they found a kiln that had protruded onto the lot from lot 48 to the north. He also found evidence of Ellis's influence he found several vessels that were similar to Staffordshire and Leeds styles. He also found hints of stoneware production, primarily some kiln furniture and earthenware that had been really highly fired. He also found the remains of six faience ring bottles. Then in the 1970s, John Clouser came back to lot 39 and followed up on Albright's original research. There was no evidence of the kiln that was shown on Minin's map, which is the map I've been using. Um, but there were some pieces of kiln furniture and faience that were recovered, and these mainly came from the upper layers of soil uh, near the lot's southern border with lot 38. They had been jumbled together with more recent artifacts. One of the things that Clauser concluded was that the kiln was most likely destroyed by the basement of the Van Vleck house, which now sits on that location. During reconstruction of the Van Vleck house in 1976, the construction crew working on the basement came across the opening to a kiln on lot 38. In 2007, after Old Salem Museums and Gardens purchased Lot 38 from Salem Congregation, Michael Hartley, the director of archaeology at Old Salem, was able to relocate and assess the condition of the opening of that kiln. And what they found was that it was in excellent condition. 
Here's some photographs of the um, work on lot 39, specifically reconstructing the Van Vleck house, and then also what the opening of that kiln looked like. Um, the perspective that you're seeing is from lot 39, looking to the south into lot 38. So in the 1970s, we knew that there was an opening for a kiln on 38, but we still didn't know how much of that kiln was intact, what the size of the kiln was, or what the design of the kiln was. So that brings you to the lot 38 project today. Um, I started the project as part of my dissertation research in 2016, um, and I've continued ever since. The aerial photo that I have on the overhead here shows lots 38, 39, 48, and 49. These were all associated with the pottery. And on lot 38, you see the Frank L. Stockton house with a paved driveway. It's the Stockton house and the paved driveway. The Stockton House was built around 1907, and again, after the kilns were demolished in 1831, the property was repurposed and became the site of multiple buildings and outbuildings over time. In the spring of 2016, we started by shovel testing the southwest corner of the property. We knew where the opening for that kiln was, and so we wanted to work from the other end of the lot toward that kiln to see if we could find any evidence of other pottery-related structures or even other kilns. Basically, we didn't find any evidence of pottery-related structures south of the kiln opening. So by that summer, we opened an excavation block over the top of the kiln to assess how much of the kiln was intact, uncover its footprint, and figure out its overall design. We've been doing that since 2016. I've actually, I'm just about ready to wrap up all the field work on that block excavation this coming month. Um, at that point, I'll just be doing mapping, photographing. But the other thing that we were able to do in the fall, this fall, um, we've been able to have a geophysical survey done on the lot. Uh, this was done under the direction of Professor Dale Bonensteel at UNC State University, um, who's running a class on geophysics this semester. And so what he was able to do was do a geophysical survey of the shovel-tested area and also the back of the property, looking for any evidence, again, of pottery-related uh, features and any potential waster dumps. So the block excavation, again, after shovel testing the southwest corner of the property and not finding any pottery related features, we opened up this block excavation. Starting in the summer of 2016, we had a field crew of seven summer archaeology interns, and we worked on this excavation for four weeks. We were able to excavate a 10 foot by 20 foot block down to the top of the collapsed kiln in the north half of that block. In 2017, we had a field crew of community volunteers, and we were able to expand the block to the west and north. We uncovered portions of the old ground surface, excavated a unit on the west edge of the kiln, following the builder's trench down to its base, and we began excavating deeper in the south half of the block, where we had identified a second feature. This feature was filled with pottery production-related material, primarily kiln furniture and pottery wasters. In 2018, we bisected the kiln in the north half of the block and began bisecting the second feature that we had identified in 2017. Again, this fall, we had a geophysical survey of the lot, um, and I want to give a special shout out to Professor Bone and Steel, 
Um, he is generously offered to survey several selected lots associated with the old Salem Hidden Town Project. The Hidden Town Project is a project that looks for evidence of enslaved house sites in Salem. And because of Lot 38's connection with Peter Oliver, this was one of the properties that was selected for geophysical survey. So he used both electromagnetic induction and ground penetrating radar, and we should have the results, the final results of that survey pretty soon. Uh, so again, thank you, Professor Bonensteel. Yay, fewer STPs that I have to dig in the back of the lot. And there's Professor Bonensteel. So another important component of this project and something that drew me to this particular project from the beginning was its potential to be a public archaeology project. Its location on Main Street draws visitors from Old Salem as well as community members. And because it's part of my dissertation research, the site is free and open to the public to visit when we're working there. In 2016, we incorporated formal archaeology days on Fridays with a display that was manned by our archaeology interns, along with informal interpretation at the block excavation itself. We've been able to continue with informal interpretations where individuals and groups can just stop by the site uh, when the crew or myself are working there, and they can just ask any questions and we'll try our best to answer them. Occasionally, we have large groups that visit the site as well. In the laboratory, we have several student interns and community members that help with the processing of the artifacts that we recover. And pictured here are Gary and LaDonna Christ. Gary on the left is a direct descendant of Master Potter Rudolph Christ. I've been very fortunate to have help from a total of seven interns and 27 field and laboratory volunteers. And currently, we're just shy of about 8,000 visitors to the site. So that was some background on the project and previous research. Now I'd like to return to the themes that I introduced at the beginning. As a planned religious community, Salem provides an excellent case study illustrating the relationship between religion and economics, specifically as it relates to the production of pottery. Historians of 18th and 19th century Moravians remind us that even within their own time, Moravians often expe express their religious experience and identity through practices that set them apart from their contemporaries. Zinzendorf's blood and wounds theology, for example, emphasized a deeply personal and demonstrative focus on the crucifixion of Christ as a path to spiritual growth over rational discourse and scholarly debate. Moravians organized their congregations into choirs based on an individual's age, sex, and marital status. Choirs for single brothers and sisters were established. Choirs for married brothers and sisters. There were choirs for widowed brothers and sisters. And even choirs for boys and girls. In Salem, they established communal living quarters for Salem's br single brothers and single sisters. And you can see in the top right corner a photograph of the single brother's house in Salem. They even buried their dead in God's Acre, the congregation graveyard, based on the choir system, instead of plots organized around nuclear families. Their ultimate goal as pietists was to live a life completely in accordance with Christ's will. Christ was even appointed as the official chief elder of the church in 1741. So in addition to prayer, Moravian leaders often sought the Lord's direct input through the lot, where after prayerful deliberation, one of three slips of paper was drawn at random, containing one of three possible answers, an affirmative, 
a negative or a blank. The blank was taken as a sign to continue to pray about the issue and ask again later. The lot was consulted about a number of issues from those that could affect the entire community to proposed marriages between individual members. Again, the idea was that everything should be done according to Christ's will, and the lot provided an opportunity for Christ to make his will known. Ideally in Salem, only certain members were supposed to regularly interact with non-Moravian visitors, which they called strangers. These included church leaders and the heads of the various trades. Master craftsmen had to be married before they could take over a trade. And we know that the wives of Salem's master potters provided labor that helped sustain the business. For example, when tallow was taken in barter at the pottery, Sister Oust made candles to resell. When Rudolph Chris took over as master potter, Sister Chris was given the same option and allowed to keep however many candles that she thought she needed for her household. The pottery often took items in on barter. Butter, for example, was traded in the pottery for wares. Then, when the church asserted greater control, butter was taken down to the community store and shoppers were given a ticket to redeem at the pottery. In the early years of the pottery, Sister Oust and Sister Christ played an important role in this barter economy, helping to transform bartered goods such as tallow and butter into supplies for their own households and into commodities to resell. In addition to the economic support a spouse could provide, historian Daniel Thorpe points out that marriage was also seen as a spiritual defense against the temptations of the world that many master craftsmen faced when they regularly interacted with strangers. So in 1780, when Master Potter Gottfried Oust was looking to remarry and asked if he could go to Pennsylvania to find a spouse, the issue was put to the lot. And when it was approved, the result meant that the church leaders now had to expedite the marriage of Rudolf Christ, Oust's senior journeyman. Quote, as the pottery cannot be managed except by a married couple. Christ's marriage proposal was approved and he was put in charge of the pottery while Oust was away. So this addresses some of the social context about religion and pottery in Salem. But what about the connection between religion and the pottery that was actually produced? Beckerdite and Brown in Ceramics in America make a compelling argument where they connect the motifs on trailed slipware dishes with Moravian religious symbolism. They argue that many of the plant motifs on plates, such as lilies, anemones, and pomegranates, functioned as metaphors that many Christians would identify with. The anemones, for example, reference the popular belief that these flowers sprang up from the drops of blood that fell to the ground during Christ's crucifixion. This certainly would have resonated with Zinzendorf's blood and wounds theology. If we can see religious symbolism on trailed slipware, what are we to make of Salem's utilitarian earthenware, stoneware, faience, and even the production of Staffordshire and Leeds-inspired wares? How might these also be connected to religious belief and practice? So far, the most popular interpretation of utilitarian wares has been that they are just that, utilitarian, and not much more. Their meaning gained cultural significance over time as part of a broader Moravian identity, but producing these wares offered little in the way of religious edification. And British-inspired wares? These were produced solely for the outside market. I question the idea that the production of pottery without explicit religious iconography played little to no role in the religious lives of Moravians. First, the church's portion of the profit from the pottery, like other trades in town, went, at least in part, to help support their missionary work. Second, we should really test the notion that Moravians passed on British-inspired wares in favor of more traditional forms. 
We need to compare several domestic sites in Salem from this time period to get a better and more accurate picture of consumer choice within the community. And third, I think we may need to reframe the question. We need to shift from looking almost exclusively at what pottery was made in Salem, and we need to also explore how that pottery was made and sold. As historian Catherine Engel reminds us, quote, what mattered most to Moravians was the sense enforced by the community that the transaction had been carried out in a godly manner. If we take this statement seriously, then for the Moravians, the way things were made and sold could bring an individual closer to Christ, or it could undermine that relationship. As a result, work and trade in the congregation pottery was often written about in moral terms. In 1788, Master Potter Gottfried Aust's apprentice, Franz Stuber, delivered an ultimatum that he wouldn't stay in the pottery if he could not be in charge of selling its wares. He was reminded by the collegium that he was bound to oust and, quote, that he cannot expect to be treated as a brother as long as he keeps this improper spirit. Apprenticeships carried both earthly and spiritual weight behind them in the community. When Aust's successor, Rudolf Christ, was dealing with the bad behavior of his apprentice, John Butner, the incident that I opened this talk with, he basically had two choices, repent or forfeit his apprenticeship and leave the community. Occasionally, non-Moravians were also employed in the pottery, doing what was often referred to as, quote, day work, what I like to think of as the Moravian equivalent of today's at-will employment. This meant that they could be dismissed at any time if their behavior was deemed harmful to the rest of the community. Sometimes the pottery sought out the additional labor from their non-Moravian neighbors. Other times it arrived by chance. Either way, the circumstances were often viewed through the lens of religion. In 1773, the arrival of the itinerant Staffordshire potter William Ellis from John Bartlam's factory in South Carolina was recorded in the following way, quote, that Ellis should now come of his own accord makes us think that the Almighty means that this art should be established here. So we have given him permission to stay. But just to be safe, they also added, quote, though only on the same terms as other day laborers who can be dismissed at any time. So when we read church leaders' justification for the building of a faience kiln in 1793 to attract new customers, because, quote, there are enough potters around us where they would go otherwise, we shouldn't view this in strictly economic terms. We shouldn't overlook the Moravians' desire as pietists to live all aspects of their lives in accordance with Christ's will. Competition may have been the economic reality of the world around them, but they likely also recognized that it was Christ's will that had brought the itinerant parl, uh, potter, Karl Eisenberg from Germany, to show them how to make faience in the first place. And capitalizing on Eisenberg's knowledge was most likely seen as another opportunity to follow a path laid out by the Lord. The second theme I'd like to talk about today is the relationship between race and landscape, specifically the experience of Peter Oliver. As I mentioned earlier, we know of one enslaved potter who worked in the congregation pottery, and that was Peter Oliver. He was born in King County, Virginia in 1766, where he was first only known as Oliver. He first appears in Moravian records in August of 1784, where he's a hired laborer in Bethania, where he had also been rented from his Virginia master. In 1785, the Single Brothers House in Salem took over his lease, and he was transferred to the Single Brothers House, where he worked in the kitchen, garden, and craft house. By 1786, the church bought Peter Oliver outright. And after they posed the question to the lot 
um, and received an affirmative response, he was considered a candidate for baptism and began Bible lessons. Later, the lot drew several negative times before returning a positive at which he was finally baptized. In 1786, he was baptized as Peter Oliver and he officially joined Salem's Single Brothers Choir. In 1788, he was sent to Bethabara to learn pottery under Rudolf Christ. Christ by this time was a journeyman working under his old master, Gottfried Aust, and he had just received permission to become the master potter in Bethabara. Now, Christ had chafed for several years under Aust, um, but he saw an opportunity with the arrival of William Ellis. And he saw that opportunity as his chance to specialize in making these Staffordshire and Leeds-inspired wares, something that apparently Aust showed little interest in doing. So he ultimately delegated the production to Christ. This gave Christ greater autonomy. The Collegium also approved of the plan for Chris to take over the pottery in Bethabara, likely because they were tired of being stuck in the middle between these two potters. In Salem, there could only be one master potter for, or one master for each trade, and for pottery, oust was it. So moving to Bethabara represented an opportunity for Chris to elevate his status, and for Peter Oliver, it meant the potential to learn a lucrative trade. When they arrived in Bethabara, the minister took each of them aside, explaining what was expected in their relationship, that Peter Oliver was to be obedient and Christ was to treat him humanely. Although Peter Oliver was not formally an apprentice, Christ had to post a bond for him like other apprentices. But there was an exception. If Peter Oliver did not act according to the rules of the congregation, Chris agreed that he would sell him. Chris eventually returned to Salem in 1789 to take over after Oust's death. Peter Oliver was not allowed to accompany him because Peter Oliver wanted to get married and the church strictly limited the number of slaves allowed in town. Peter Oliver was then sold to Bethabara's new master potter, Gottlob Kraus. Church records record that Christ was able to sell Peter Oliver at a higher price now because of his new skill set. Again, contrast this with indentured apprentices. When their skills increased, it usually meant they were well on their way to becoming a journeyman potter in their own right and they could earn wages. When Peter Oliver's skill increased, others profited from it. Peter Oliver was finally granted permission to return to Salem in 1795. After the Aufseher Collegium reported that he was still asking and praying to return. Christ, who was now on the Aufseher Collegium, suggested that he could take him into day work at the pottery, using the same term that applied to strangers. Quote, and whenever something would happen, he should be dismissed at once. In 1796, Peter Oliver returned to Salem. 1799, he became a communicant member of Salem Congregation. He went on to buy his freedom soon after. Several scholars have speculated that he may have been able to sell some of the wares that he made in the pottery. But so far, the documentary evidence is not clear on this. Peter Oliver would go on to marry and raise a family on a farm leased just north of town in 1802. And he continued to worship at home Moravian church until his death in 1810. No surviving pieces of pottery from Bethabara or Salem have been attributed to Peter Oliver. Although few signed pieces of any of Salem's master potters actually exist. It's important to remember that given how many people worked in the pottery at any one time and given the amount of production that the pottery produced, they all likely had a hand in the production process of any given piece of pottery. 
It's also possible that since it was a church-owned business, individualism as expressed by an artist's signature may have been frowned upon. What we do know about Peter Oliver's time as a freedman is that in 1806 and 1807, he was selling reed stems for pipes in the Salem store. These were being exported to a merchant in Philadelphia, and then Peter Oliver would receive the proceeds. The reed of choice was likely Arundaria gigantea, a.k.a. giant cane or river cane, a native plant to the U.S. And I've got a photo of John Lineback that was taken in the 1860s where he's holding a stub stem pipe with one of these reeds in it. You can see the reed right there. Recent research by Michael and Martha Hartley with Old Salem's Department of Archaeology has actually identified the location of the farm that Peter Oliver leased as a freedman. And it seems likely that since the property had a spring running through it, it would also be a good source for the reeds that he sold at the community store. On this later map of Salem, we can see his likely path from his farm to the church, which would have taken him past the pottery. Pottery was still a meaningful part of Peter Oliver's landscape. And as a freedman, he continued to draw on his experience as a potter to help provide for his family. So what evidence do we have of Peter Oliver's potential presence on Lot 38? Well, the best evidence would be from what I have identified as the location of the 1793 Fayance Kiln and Shed. This was used but not torn down until 1805. It's a feature, that feature that we identified in the south end of the excavation block that was full of pottery production related materials. And what we know about the feature from the records is that in 1793, the kiln for burning faience was described as being eight foot by eight foot and built inside of a shed. It's the only kiln built across the street that we know of that is described as being built inside of a shed. And this is the only feature on lot 38 that has clear evidence of a structure. So what does the archeology span reveal? Well, first of all, this structure is cut down about two feet into the subsoil. And you can see where it cuts into an old ground surface. So there's the old ground surface. On top of that ground surface, it's capped by a compacted layer with pottery wasters and kiln furniture fragments. This layer right here. Now that layer also leads to the back of the kiln that's in the north half of the excavation block. So this structure was used and torn down before that other kiln was being loaded and unloaded and all of that material was being dropped in the uh, unloading process. On top of that, we've got a brick scatter, um, likely associated with the fill that accompanied the introduction of the, main, of the um, streetcar on Main Street in 1890. And then, of course, on top of that, we've got the current ground surface. So the total depth of this structure, this feature, um, from top to bottom is about five and a half feet below the current ground surface. The interior of the feature is about eight to nine feet wide. So size-wise, that fits. We also found a layer of wall plaster in the feature. That's this light color layer right here. So in that we found, um, and in the layers right below it, we found several hand wrought nails, window glass. Um, below that, carbonized stone, bricks that had been vitrified, wasters, 
sagger fragments, and other pieces of kiln furniture. We even found some large mammal bones, which suggests that people may have been spending enough time in and around this structure that they may have been taking a meal or two while they were working there. Now the red stain in the floor, which is right here, appears to be highly fired handmade bricks. They're very decomposed, um, but I'm thinking this is possibly where that small burning oven may have sat. It's not unlike what was left from Oust's first kiln that Stanley South described in Bethabara. And like that kiln, this appears that it was literally disassembled. You can also see disarticulated stone and bricks in the walls. Um, and it appears that the structure, when they were done with it and they tore it down, they probably robbed what material that they could reuse. It was likely torn down around 1805. And so this structure would have been a specific structure on lot 38 that was standing when Peter Oliver returned to Salem. And things have gone dark. So um, that kind of covers the feature and things that we found in the feature that I think lines up with the description of the 1793 Fayence kiln. Um, the next thing that I want to start talking about are some of the artifacts and specifically some of the pottery that we found inside that feature. But I could probably take a question or two on things that I've already covered, if anybody has any burning questions. Okay. <laughs> All right, on with the show. Okay, so what kinds of artifacts, what kinds of pottery have we found inside this feature? So first of all, most of the pottery that I found inside the feature appear to be older forms. Um, it's very tricky in dealing with Moravian pottery because the Moravians have a strong tradition of making traditional forms for a long period of time. So things like leg glazed earthenware, um, other sites, there's more um, of a temporal, tight temporal boundary and using that as a dating method. On Moravian sites, they're using lead glazed earthenware almost up until the 20th century. So it's not as helpful. Um, but my first impression of some of the things that we found in this particular feature is that they're older. So we've got the base of a modeled slipware bowl in the lower left. This is in bisque. At the top, we've got a trailed piece of slipware um, with a red background in bisque. And then there's a slipware base to a hollowware vessel form in the lower right. We found a number of pipes, um, and they're almost all what appear to be an older style. This particular one is white clay, and it's a stub stem tobacco pipe 
with a matching sagger pin. Again, these appear to be older, and this particular form is often identified as an Indian. Um, we don't have any of the forms that have been found on the Schaffner Krauss site that were part of the presidential campaigns. So we don't have like the Ulysses S. Grant pipe and the, the Taylor pipe. So again, the pipes are putting us in the right time frame. But perhaps the best connection is the faience that we've found. We've found several fragments of faience within this particular feature. And again, we know 1793, the itinerant potter Carl Eisenberg comes into town, um, and he left behind a handwritten faience recipe book. It's also interesting that this wasn't the first time that the pottery had known about tin enameling. For example, Oust was already aware of the use of tin ash, and he had sent Chris to the New River in 1776 in search of tin ash for glazing when they couldn't get red lead. But Eisenberg's arrival in 1793 seems to be the real catalyst to get experimentation and the production of faience off the ground in Salem. And of course, we've known about the production of faience ring bottles since Stanley South's work in the 1960s. And I found some other ring bottle fragments within this feature. But I've also found other pieces of faience in different colors and different vessel forms. The pieces in the upper left were actually analyzed by Dr. David Cranford at the Research Labs of Archaeology. Um, and using PXRF, he verified the presence of tin in these particular sherds. The one in the upper right looks like it's part of maybe the lip for a teacup. And the one on the left looks like it may be a base sherd um, for another small hollowware vessel. And again, different colors. The one on the right seems to be more of like a robin's egg blue. The one on the left is more of a salmony pink. Recently, I found another piece, the one in the upper right. This is a piece that appears to be um, a piece of faience with overglaze hand painting. It's polychrome and probably a floral pattern. Now, when the pottery transitioned from a church-owned business in 1829, John Holland returned several molds and tools to the church. And on that list of the items that he returned, he also lists returning several faience pots in colors that were white, blue, green, and yellow, including one that had fine hand painting. Now this was after the pottery was probably long done trying to make faience, but these particular vessels had been curated. The other thing that we found in this particular feature is a hand-built and burnished shouldered pan and you can see the fire cloud on it. This looks very similar to a vessel that's a Catawba vessel that David Cranford reported about in his dissertation. Now we know that the Moravians traded with the Catawba. They also had ties again to the creek and of course the missions to the Cherokee. Now we don't know exactly how this particular piece got here. It's possible it could have been picked up on any number of the Moravians trading or missionary trips outside of Salem. It could also have been taken in as barter in the pottery. And remember, Holland returned faience vessels that the pottery had essentially curated, perhaps as kind of a type collection or as inspiration. Um, so it's possible that the potters working here 
took a look at this particular vessel and for whatever reason thought it would be a good addition to have around the workshop. But regardless of who made it and how exactly it got here, it's a good reminder that the Moravians were always part of a broader colonial world. The third theme I'd like to talk about is the relationship between tradition and innovation. And I think I see this relationship being played out in three main areas on lot 38. First, the optimization of kiln design. Second, the blending of traditional and new wares into the pottery production. And third, improvisation and creativity in the use of kiln furniture. So in terms of kiln design, I'm not going to shift to the kiln that was the opening of which was first located in the 1970s and that we've worked to uncover um, in the north half of the excavation block. This kiln is roughly 15 to 16 feet long from opening to back wall. And it's in the right location for the kiln that is shown on Mining's 1822 map. The photo in the top left corner is from the 1970s. And then as we open, working off of that opening to the south, um, you can see that it's got part of the tunnel that is still intact. I believe it was probably built in 1811 and torn down in 1831 when they built a new kiln for John Holland on the back of his property across the street. And I'll talk more about the reasoning why I think this is the 1811 kiln versus the 1806 kiln later. But the archaeology reveals that this kiln was also dug down about two to two and a half feet into subsoil. And you can see the this is the old surface right here. And then it's a straight shot down into the builder's trench into subsoil. At the north end, the tunnel is nearly 10 feet long. Um, and it has an interior tunnel um, that is about five feet long. And we found ash from the opening of that tunnel all the way to where it leads into the wear chamber. The first five foot length of that long tunnel, um, I think probably you could have entered it stooping down, bending over or crouching. Um, much of that arch, that arch has been almost completely removed during the demolition process. But that second five foot length with the intact portion of arch, uh, the opening is approximately 1.9 feet tall by 2.2 feet wide. It's too small and too long to really feed pottery in from that uh, end. The interior tunnel actually reduces to by 25% by the time it hits the wear chamber. So in effect, what you've got is you have this interior tunnel that's more like a funnel. And I think that they may have designed that intentionally so that they could increase the temperature of the fire and the pressure before it hit the wear chamber. Looking back um, from the wear chamber, we've got part of a bag wall that's still intact. The wear chamber itself is rectangular. Um, it was probably vertically oriented and tall. We don't know how tall because of the demolition process. Um, but the measurements, it's about six feet wide by four feet deep. So it's a relatively small wear chamber. But again, if it was vertically oriented, you could potentially stack more wares that way. We bisected the wear chamber and found and found no evidence of um, a chimney or a flue system or support piers. 
Um, we didn't really find any good evidence of intact flooring um, on the bottom of the kiln. Instead, what we found were a series of layers of dirt that had been uh, low baked, and we had wasters throughout those layers. So it was almost like a, perhaps a dirt floor that had been used, cleaned out, they dropped wasters here and there, they then added more dirt, that became baked, and so it um, accumulated over time. What we did find, though, on the back here was what looks like a step cut down into the subsoil. And so it looks like this may have been a back-loaded um, kiln where the potters would have built a temporary opening in the back of the ware chamber, stacked all their kiln there, closed it up, then went around to the front and started their fire. But again, kind of like the feature to the south, um, this looks like it was pretty highly robbed. Um, we don't have much left of the ware chamber walls. We have a few stones in the builder's trench. Um, and really, the only portion of the kiln that is still intact are the bricks that are associated with the arch and where the firebox would have been. Um, and again, that would be consistent if you were trying to recycle as many bricks and stones as you could, especially if you were going to build John Holland a new kiln. Um, and then you leave behind those bricks and stones that have been exposed to direct heat um, because those would have been compromised. So this has also led us to um, reevaluate mining's 1822 map. Um, and that's that base map that I've been using throughout the lecture today. Um, it seems like mining's map, com it combines both realistic and stylized elements. So the, the overall property boundaries seem very accurate. Um, but the scale... The scale is off, um, and most of the houses look like they're fairly stylized. And when you look at the scale of the kilns that are depicted, and if you compare that to the scale for lot 49 and 48, um, each one of those kilns would have to be about 30 feet long, and that's about twice the size of what we've actually found. So again, the ovens on the map are too large to match the archaeology. But I think mining probably drew what he saw at the time. And so when you think about how deep this kiln is dug down into subsoil and how much of that tunnel would have been um, obscured, he probably didn't see the tunnel he probably saw this vertical wear chamber, and then there would have been a white picket fence um, between Main Street and the property. That was one of the conditions that the church said Oust would have to adhere to if he was going to use those lots across the street. He'd have to put up a fence. So I think that you know mining is drawing probably what he saw to the best of his ability at the time. But there are definitely discrepancies between the map and the archaeological reality. All right, so then blending traditional and new wares. So I think this is a second strategy that the Moravian potters employed in Salem. Potters continued making what we identify as these kinds of traditional wares and forms. Um, made wheel thrown coarse earthenware since Oust arrived in Bethabara in 1755. These utilitarian forms continued really up until the 20th century. Uh, we also know that they continued making decorative trailed slipware at least until 1829, um, in part because things called flowered dishes show up on the inventories for John Holland when he was the master potter. 
So they were willing to incorporate new techniques and styles, and they basically, I think, just folded them in and expanded the range of pottery that they offered. Now, some of the new forms that they incorporated um, included these British-inspired fine wares. Um, and earlier, I showed you examples of like tortoise shell, um, some of the Staffordshire and Leeds-inspired mugs. Um, and we actually have evidence of some of those forms coming from Lot 38. Um, I've got portions of um, pottery that have a tortoise shell glaze on them. Um, I also have a lot of extruded handles or strap handles. Uh, these things seem to break like tavern pipe stems. I've got them all over the place. Um, but I've also found examples of um, feather edge and some royal pattern as well. In addition to that, we're also finding examples of molded bottles and figurines. Now, when we first started the project, you know, we really focused on uh, Rudolf Christ's introduction of animal bottles and figural bottles. And we thought for sure that we were gonna find a lot, um, a lot of evidence of that kind of production. And to be honest, I've actually only found a handful of molded wares like figurines. Um, and I think part of that is because, at least inside the 1811 kiln, I think what's going on is that in 1829, the church said that uh, Holland could take over the pottery and run it as a private business, and in exchange for renting the tools in the workshop, oh, here we go. I'll backtrack a little bit. So here's some of the, um, the queen's wear and extruded handles. I've got an example of feather edge that's come from lot 38. And then here are some of the molded bottle and figurine pieces that we have. So I've got what looks like part of a chicken, still probably with some red lead on it. Um, I've got what looks like the base for either a chicken or an owl. And then we also found this molded sheep figurine. Now this particular molded sheep, I think it's the first one that we've found um, like this archeologically. Um, and when they're recorded in the annual inventories of the pottery, they're always referred to as toys. So they're either listed as toy sheep or they're listed as there's toy birds and sheep or toy dogs and sheep, but they're always listed as toys. And we know that the pottery was making, in addition to wares for your table and in your kitchen, we also know that they were making doll parts, they were making marbles, they were making toys. Um, so this certainly suggests the production of these small sheep figurines and toys. So again, we thought we would find more. And I think the reason why we're not is that inside the 1811 kiln, um, remember Aus took over the pottery in 1829. He ran it as a private business. And part of that deal was that the church would build him a new kiln on the back of his property. That was promised in 1829. We don't see a reference to actually selecting the site for that kiln until 1831. And so from 1829 to 1831, you know, I think that this kiln is being used by John Holland and his crew. And subsequently, because it's not a congregation run business, there are no pottery inventories for the period from 1829 to 31. So all we have really is the archeology. span um, and I haven't run the numbers on the types of wares and wasters that we're getting out of this kiln, 
but intuitively it looks like Holland may be making some other economic choices that perhaps figural bottles were no longer the big selling item that they had been earlier. Um, and that now that John Holland has to make new economic choices, he may be shifting his priorities. And that may be why we're not seeing as many um, molded bottles and figurines. The other possibility is that the rate of failure on these molded figurines might have been very low. Um, so those are two possibilities why we're not finding as much. All right, stoneware. So again, Stanley South in the 60s found what looked like incidental um, or circumstantial evidence, rather, of stoneware production. Um, we, pretty much from day one when we were excavating, we started finding incidental salt glazing on kiln furniture, um, like these um, comb setting tiles in the bottom left. Then we actually found some pieces that I would consider stoneware wasters. So this piece in the um, upper left, it has salt glazing. It looks like it's been exposed to a reducing atmosphere. You can see a couple spots that look like uh, kiln scars. This is actually a form that we see in bisque earthenware from Bethabara. And Stanley South had identified these as um, pint cups. So it looks like they're taking a traditional form and they're translating it into stoneware. Now the other question is, what did the stoneware that Chris showed the Aufseher Collegium, what did that actually look like? And I have a piece that's pretty intriguing. It's this one on the left. This is part of a handle. Um, it has been fired to stoneware hardness. And there's no crazing in the glaze. It's been hand painted with blue hand paint in a floral pattern, but it looks like not all of that painting really took. Um, and when you flip it over and you look at this under magnification, you can see a very, very fine stippling probably from very fine granules of salt. But there are also places on this particular sherd where it looks like the salt hasn't completely um, melted. So it's something that I'm thinking is probably a waster, and it looks like it may be a good candidate for some of the white salt glaze stoneware that Chris may have been experimenting with. Again, this one also comes out of that 1793 um, feature that we have at the south end of the block. In terms of kiln furniture, we're seeing all kinds of what I think are absolutely um, fascinating and neat. And then I talked to local potters and I mentioned kiln furniture and they kind of roll their eyes. Um, because it's kind of a necessary evil. But as archaeologists, of course, we always find like some of the most mundane and everyday objects are some of the most fascinating for us. Um, the images of the, the two images on the left are the bottom of a sagger. And it looks like the walls have been busted on that sagger. On the back side, is written 1813. This was deposited in the kiln that I think dates from 1811 to 1831. On the interior, you can see what looked like a lot of glaze drips, perhaps vessels and bits and pieces of vessels that have adhered to it. So it may have had a second life and used as a setting tile. We find all kinds of saggers, different sizes. We find large fragments of plate saggers, but we also find very small saggers that seem to be um, for specialty pieces, perhaps uh, small bowls. Um, and they often have pieces of kiln furniture fused, um, often adhered with glaze um, to the bottom of those saggers. 
We find all kinds of setting tiles with glazed drips. We've got flat tiles. We have these three-armed combed setting tiles. Um, we have some really large ones. Um, and those, I think that what they may have used them for is if you had a large crock or a large vessel and the first one you stood on its bottom standing up and then you put one of these three-armed setting tiles on top of it and then you take another vessel and flip it over, it allows enough space for the hot air and gas to circulate between those two large vessels. On smaller examples of these, we actually see that they put a hole in the middle of it. And I think, again, because it's a smaller um, setting tile, it's probably to help aid the circulation of those hot gases. We also find a number of clay roof tiles. Now, the pottery, among all the different things that it made from clay stove pieces, it also made um, clay roof tiles. In Salem, Salem doesn't really start using wooden shingles until about the 1820s. Until then, it's all clay roof tiles because the church was very concerned about preventing fires. And so what we see throughout the site is we see some cases where you've got broken roof tiles, perhaps from a shed over one of the kilns. But we also see pieces that have glaze drips. And in some cases, we actually have parts of fused vessels on broken tile shingles. And we think that they're probably using those as setting tiles as well. When we look at all the different types of trivets that we get, you know, we get kind of your, your typical three arm trivets with the, the little spikes at each end. Um, and as Bivens and South have written, you know, a lot of these were molded, but we're actually seeing a lot of these trivets that look like they were actually hand um, made as well. And we're getting finger impressions, um, some really kind of asymmetrical things going on. And it looks like based on the glaze drips that some of these trivets, depending on the vessel that it was used to hold, um, if it was a vessel with a flat bottom, they probably set the trivet down with the, uh, the tine sticking up. But then in other cases, if they had a vessel with a foot ring, they would just flip that trivet over. And we can see that with depending on where the glaze is dripping on that trivet. We also get a lot of pugging wads. Um, and these, these are just expedient little piles of clay that the potter put in between saggers. Um, just like when you load your uh, moving truck and there's always that piece of furniture that needs a blanket or something, well, they would take a wet piece of clay and they would just shove it in there. Um, but what's neat about it for us is that you can see the finger impressions and the fingerprints on a lot of these. So, you know, even though we're not getting pieces that are signed by individuals, this is probably the most intimate um, object that kind of shows that production process. And it also says something about um, the kind of improvisation that took place as potters were stacking their kiln. All right, so what about the kiln on lot 39? Um, and again, you know, Clouser's work showed pretty definitively that that kiln is probably not there anymore. Um, is there anything that we can say about that particular kiln? And the one thing that we can say is that when we were excavating the large kiln in the north half of this excavation block, when we were first coming down all, all of that demolition rubble, we started finding pieces of stone flooring sitting on top of that intact um, arch. And now those pieces had um, parts of kiln furniture, parts of vessels that were adhered to it. Um, and we started wondering, well, where, where is this stuff coming from? It seems like it would, it doesn't seem like it would be the floor of this particular kiln, um, the 1811 kiln, you know, it's, it just, it's out of place. And it's almost like textbook reverse stratigraphy. Well, if digging the basement for what 
became the Van Vleck House, destroyed the kiln on Lot 39, then it seems possible that some of that material would have been thrown right next door and that ended up on top um, of our demolished kiln. So then finally, I guess what kind of conclusion have I come to about which kiln is which and what was the building sequence on lot 38 and lot 39. So again, we know 1793, Christ builds a kiln that's eight foot by eight foot inside of a shed for burning faience. I think he was probably also trying to burn some stoneware in there as well. Um, and that size and the kind of demolition that we're finding in that feature matches with the kiln that's in the south end of the block pretty well. So I think that's probably the 1793 kiln. Now in 1806, he's given permission to build a kiln that's twice the size. And then in 1811, he gets permission to build another kiln that's roughly the same size. And that 1811 kiln is meant to replace the original kiln in the workshop across the street. So based on Mining's map, he shows two kilns, one on 39 and one on 38. One could be the 1806, the other might be the 1811. What we know from the records is that the 1811 kiln was supposedly built south of his second kiln across the street. All right, so if that's the case, if the 1811 kiln is built south of his second kiln that's across the street, then I think it's pretty likely that the kiln on lot 38 is that kiln. So it would be south of the second kiln that he built. Again, the first one would be the Fayance kiln here. Then 1806, he builds a kiln on 39. And then in 1811, he builds his kiln south of the second kiln that he had built across the street. Um, again, the reason why I don't think that this feature here is the 1811 kiln, um, primarily the stratigraphy. Again, we've got that work surface that is coming out of the back of this kiln and it caps this feature right here. And then also the artifacts that we found in it, those seem to be the right time period. And then the evidence of a shed um, especially with that collapsed wall with all the plaster. We don't see any evidence of a, um, any kind of structure that this particular kiln on 38, the big one, we don't see any evidence that that was actually built inside a structure. The one to the south is the only one that looks like there's a substantial structure with probably a kiln inside of it. All right, so last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge um, everybody who has supported this project, um, all of our interns and volunteers. You know, without their help, none of this would have been possible. And so I'm incredibly grateful uh, for all of their assistance. And I can take questions. I think we just have, I think we'll just have time. I don't know if he's going to say anything. Do you have one or two questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming today, and thank you again to Jeffrey for presenting on his day. You're welcome.